problems, worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear. Welcome back to our 9 p.m. talk series. My name is David, and we've been looking at this theme of be not afraid. These words that God speaks to us, these words that we could live our life by. We don't need to be afraid because God has got us. This evening, we look at faithfully following, faithfully following His, his call in our life, his, his words, His encouragement. And we've been following through in the Bible this, the work that God has been doing. We started with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. The people found themselves in Egypt and then were liberated and set free with Moses. They received the Ten Commandments and they were, they were becoming this nation, this people, this, this fulfillment of a promise. Remember the promise that God made to Abraham. And it's really important that we keep remembering the purpose of the promise. The purpose of being the people of God is to show everybody else what it means to be loved by God and to invite everybody else into that relationship with God. We're called and chosen in order to serve and to serve others. So we. We have to faithfully follow what God asks us to do. And sometimes our fears, our insecurities can get in the way of that. It's no wonder that God says so many times, don't be afraid. For me, I look back and uh, as a child, I was very uh, self-conscious and I remember being called out to the front of class at one point to read a poem and stuttering my way through the poem and it was it was excruciating and so embarrassing and it was the last thing I ever wanted to have to sort of do uh, to do again I was very conscious of what other people thought of me and I'm still conscious of that now I still battle with well what will people think and I'm frightened of people thinking that I'm foolish or doing something silly I have to just push that aside because what other people think is, is of no real uh, value to who I am. I'm loved by God, I'm made by God. I'm made in the image and likeness of God. I'm great and, and so are you. Sometimes it gets in the way when we do, a, we might have a quiz and someone will ask the question and I'll, I'll think of the answer, but I'm not quite sure of what it, what it is and I don't want to say the wrong answer. So I won't give an answer. It's the most silly little thing and I have to constantly tell myself, stop, stop being afraid, what's, what's the worst that can happen? Someone might, someone might laugh at you if I said the wrong thing. Sometimes I can get in our way of sharing our ideas and our dreams and our visions. People might think we were foolish if we dared to suggest these different things. And I remember hearing a, a band, a pop group, once describe how they, how they wrote songs together. And they said that they'd spent so much time together, they'd become so comfortable and confident with each other that they were able to just create and throw out ideas, confident in the knowledge that if it was rubbish, that, that they would say it was rubbish and then they could just put that aside and move on and they, that freedom to make mistakes with each other enables greatness to come and they've sold millions and millions of records partly because they learn to trust each other and not be afraid of being foolish in front of each other. This must be us as church, daring to speak our words and our thoughts with each other, daring to make mistakes together, daring to 
make a difference in the world. Daring to raise our heads above the parapet and challenge injustice. The more we are bold, the more we are brave, the more we faithfully follow what God calls us to do, the more God's actions can come to pass and his promise can be fulfilled. So we had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Egypt, Moses. So the next bit of our story is Joshua. And we just stop for a moment and think, Joshua taking over from Moses. You know so many stories of Moses, so many of the things that Moses was involved with. Just imagine being the person who has to follow him, following his shoes, following his footsteps. Joshua, now you're in charge. Imagine what the people of God thought when they looked at him. How's this going to work out? How is he ever going to be able to do anything like what Moses did? Parting the Red Sea, receiving the Ten Commandments, stories of Moses' face glowing as he encountered God, taking on Pharaoh, sawing out the manna and the quail and the food, leading us on, the, on a great journey and quest, liberating us, getting water out of a rock. What have you got, Joshua? How are you going to... It's, gonna not, it's not going to be as good, is it? No one could possibly follow Moses. So how does the, the book of Joshua starts with God speaking to Joshua and saying to him, don't be afraid. This is my work. I know what I'm doing and you're the one that I want to lead. But then God cautions and encourages Joshua and says to him, stay faithful to my teachings. Do what I ask you to do. That way, I'll be able to work through you and with you. And I think back to an earlier talk where I talked about Abraham and those little extras, sort of provisos, little, it's a good plan, God, but perhaps if we did it like this, perhaps if we just added a few little details. And God cautions Joshua right at the beginning to stay faithful to what I'm asking of you. And the first thing they have to do is to cross the Jordan to enter the promised land. And it seems remarkable that they take the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, you remember, is uh, this great vessel chest with uh, big staffs to help them carry. And inside the Ark of the Covenant are the Ten Commandments, the two stone tablets. There's the jar of manna, the food that God provided for them. There's the staff of Aaron, this staff used during the uh, battle with Pharaoh, this dead staff which buds into life. The Ark of the Covenant is the place where God dwells, where God encounters and meets his people. It's the most precious thing that they have. And so to cross the River Jordan, God says to Joshua, get the priests to get the Ark and carry it into the river. But th this is the Ark of the Covenant. We don't just carry it into the, into the river. And the beauty in the story is God helping Joshua realize it's all about him, not about Joshua. You, you're not going to stop the waters, Joshua. I will stop the waters and you'll be able to pass through. So he tells the priests and the people, this is what's going to happen. And I'm sure there are questions and doubts. Really, would Moses have done this? Is that the kind of thing, are you sure, Joshua? But they trust him. And as the priest's feet enter the water with the ark, the waters stop and they're able to pass into the promised land. Now the book of Joshua produces a whole host of questions because there's all sorts of conquests and destructions and killing and it's right to have a lot of questions about, about that. And a lot of people don't like the Old Testament partly because of some of these stories. It seems like God wants us to kill people and that's not, that's not God. That's not who God is. Our God is a God of love and mercy and justice and peace. So we have to listen to the stories, particularly that story of Joshua, and ask, what, 
What's the writer of this story trying to tell us? And what they're trying to tell us is stay faithful to God's word. And then God can work with us. And an example of this is when they encountered Jericho, this great walled city. And to conquer Jericho, God says, I want you to march around the city six times with the Ark of the Covenant. And on the seventh time, march around seven times and then shout. And the walls will fall and the city will be yours. Imagine being told that as the plan. Imagine someone standing up at the front of church and saying, here's, here's the plan that we're going to do. Here's what's going to change uh, the situation in our nation. Here's what's going to solve uh, poverty. I want you to do this thing and you listen and think, that's the most ludicrous plan I've ever heard. That's the situation that Joshua finds himself in. And the story shows that's what the people faithfully do. They march around silently with the ark on the first day. They repeat it on the second day, on the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. There must have been at various points during those days, people thinking, he's lost it. Joshua, I said he wasn't as good as Moses, but well, let's keep going. Let's give, him a, let's give him a chance. And on the seventh day, they march around seven times and then they shout and the walls fall. And the story is simple. And sometimes our Bible stories are that simple. It's a simple message. Do what God asks us to do, just as he asks us to do. And then he's able to do amazing things. Sometimes the little things that we do have big consequences and we can't see them. We just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. The book of Joshua ends with this challenge to the people of God. Are you going to follow him faithfully? And there's a line that Joshua uses, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you? As for you and your house, will you serve the Lord? Well, I assume your answer is yes. Otherwise, what, what, why would you be watching this if your answer isn't yes? But it's a question to keep asking ourselves day after day. Do I choose to serve him? What does that look like for me? Well, some great moments and some, some surprises on the way. I remember turning 18 and again away on a, on a retreat. God seems you know, very able to speak to me when I stop and listen. That seems like a quite an obvious statement and I, I wish I would hear myself more clearly. When I stop and listen, I hear God speak. So I should stop and listen more. So I was on retreat and during that retreat, I had to pop home to get my A-level exam results. And I needed a certain set of grades in order to go to university. And I was hoping to go to Leicester University to study biology. I didn't know what I was going to be as a biologist, but I knew that's what I loved. And so I went home, popped into the school, got my results. They weren't quite as good as I was hoping for, but they were okay and they were going to be enough to get to Leicester to do biology. But I had other thoughts and other ideas and God had other plans. And so before I went back to the retreat, I called in to see my mom and dad and told them what my results were. I remember saying to my mom, here's the results that they're not quite as good as we hoped for, but they're all right. I can still go and do biology, but..." Don't worry, because I'm not. I'm going to go to this retreat center. I'm going to live there and I'm going to work there. I'm going to help other people uh, find and experience God. I'm not going to go to university. So I'll see you later on. I'm going to head back now, finish off my retreat. I remember my mum quite clearly saying, stop, sit down. You're not going anywhere. We need to talk about this. You can't just make this huge, great decision. I know you're having a... Uh, a great time on retreat, but you can't make decisions like that just because. And my mum's a great, a great person of faith. And that sentence stopped midway through. 
as she realized what it was that she was saying. You can't make decisions like that just because God's encouraging you or directing you in a particular path. But to put my mum's mind at ease, I said, well, I won't agree anything with the priest in charge of the retreat center until after I come home and we can talk about it some more. But I'm pretty sure, mum, this is what, this is what I want to do and this is what I think God wants me to do. So I did, I talked to the priest and he said, it'd be great if you can work here, but go and chat with your mum. So I went back home and had quite a few evenings with mum and dad talking about my change of plan, not going to university, going and helping people experience and encounter God. And I agreed that, well, I won't not go to university, I'll just delay that for a year. So maybe I'll go the next year. During that year, helping people encounter God, my faith really came alive. And I began to think, actually, this is the kind of thing that I want to do with my life. I think this is what God wants me to do with my life. And so near the end of that year, I rang the university up and said, I know I said I'd come the following year and you've kept me a place, but can we just leave that for another year? I'd like another year to do some more of this serving God. And they said to me, David, make your mind up. You're, you're either coming to university or you're not. And so I said, okay, I'm not. I'm going to do this. And for three years, I did a variety of different things that I felt God was encouraging me to do. I explored a whole host of different ways of serving Him, meeting a whole host of different people. And after those three years, I did go to university but I didn't study biology, I studied uh, youth work. So I, I learned how to work with young people because I felt that's what God was asking me to do. That small decision has changed, changed everything. Would I have been happy if I'd gone off and studied biology? I think so. I love biology, I love science. I still spend a lot of my time uh, reading and studying scientific things and I'm blown away by how amazing our world is. But daring to trust God's word, God's encouragement, this is where I want you to be, this is what I want you to do, has sent me on a journey which has been fantastic. And six or so years ago, Sarah and I were uh, listening to a, an interview with the, the directors of the Catholic Bible School and they said that they wanted to uh, retire and step down. They wanted someone else to take over the running and the ministry of the Catholic Bible School. And it was a strange moment. And Sarah and I looked at each other and we both had the experience of, oh, this is something to take note of. If you'd asked us at that moment to tell you what the Catholic Bible School was, we couldn't have answered you. Didn't really know what the Catholic Bible School was or what they did. But there was something in that moment, and I, you know, I think quite clearly it was God giving us a nudge, giving us a, a call and encouragement. This is where I want you. The title was enough for us. It, it said Catholic, well, that's good, that's, that's me. It said Bible, well, I love the Word of God, that's great. And it said school. So it's something about helping people learn and grow. And so we went and we spoke to some people and we found out a bit more about it. They said, we think you'd be great. Why don't you come and do it? And so we said, okay. And so we... we gave in our notice for the jobs that we had and the security that we had. We had good, good, secure jobs to go off on the next bit of our adventure. And it's been fantastic. It's been hard. It's been difficult. But it's amazing to see people's faith come alive as they encounter his word, faithfully following step by step, little things, big things. How do I do that? Well, there's five words that I thought of in how do I do that. The first is to, to pray, to regularly spend time 
talking, sharing, sharing our thoughts and our dreams. What would we like to do? What difference would we like to make? Dare to just voice some of those ideas. Listening to God's response to our dreams and our visions, our hopes. And not just expecting instant answers or instant responses or God saying, great, leave your job, go and do this. Sometimes that's what God says, but most of the time that's not. You, know, God's got us where he wants us. And most of us, we need to serve where we are. But we should listen. And the more we listen, the easier it is to hear. And then the next is to act, to dare to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the river, to dare to look a fool, to dare to make a mistake. But it's in the acting that God can play his part, that we can discover that we can trust him, that he is faithful, that he is working on a bigger picture, that we are part of his plan. But if we just sit and hope that God will do all the things that need to be done. Somehow we, we, we inhibit his plan. We're part of the plan. We need to take that step and act. So we need to trust. And then we need to take time to reflect, to look back. How has God acted in my life? Loving God, thank you that you choose us to serve you. Our desire is to faithfully follow you. Oh Lord, we need lots of prompts. Please speak clearly to us. Give us the courage to act, to trust you. And help us as we look back and see what you've already done. Thank you that you choose us to be part of your plan. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show World TV is an impressive enterprise. Using the modern means of communication brings to our world the gospel of Jesus Christ. May their work of evangelization through means of communication be a blessing for all. I commend to you the work and the message especially of Shalom World TV. Their mission is to be fruitful and blessed. They, in their own lives, as well as those to whom they proclaim the gospel, they are to have blessing. They are to know peace, and to all, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love, this day and forever. Amen.